We've encountered and studied the white dwarf and the white dwarf or type 1a supernova, which destroys the entire star, the core that's left over. And now we've also learned about the core collapse or type 2 supernova being an iron core that's been crushed beyond the Chandra Sekar limit through the electron degeneracy continuing to collapse till it hits the next almost impenetrable barrier which is neutron degeneracy producing a neutron star. So here is an example of a neutron star. It's a supernova remnant observed in 386 AD. There's the neutron star right in the center of this remnant. Here is a an artistic rendition of a neutron star, which I kind of like. Well, it has an initial mass of 8 to 25 solar masses, so it's a large star initially. The final core mass is in the range of 1.4 to 3 solar masses. Crushed down so much, the entire solar mass is reduced to an object about the size of a small city, 10 to 15 miles across. Here it is shown a tennis ball on a map of the Washington DC area. So it's a big ball, but tiny, very tiny compared to the entire Earth, of course. Basically a giant atomic nucleus that has now about a billion tons per teaspoon or cubic centimeter. Just to get a perspective on it, the white dwarf had a density of about five tons per teaspoon and this nu neutron star stuff, the neutronium, as it's also sometimes called, is 200 million times denser than the white dwarf stuff, the material of which the white dwarf star is made out of. A paper clip at this density would have the mass of Mount Everest. And if somehow Earth got caught in its gravitational grip, like it would if it was sitting there on the map in reality, it would just be a matter of time and Earth would be assimilated onto the entire ball and it would be crushed into a ring about a half inch thick about this several mile diameter sphere. So that's pretty incredible. The magnetic fields associated would be highly concentrated. It's spinning very rapidly. Angular conservation means that if an object like the Sun became a neutron star, which it won't because it's too small, but it would have to go from the current 25-day rotation period down to about 20 times per second. And this rapidly increased rotation rate causes the magnetic field intensities to be squeezed down and, and amplified by a factor of approximately a billion. So that's the basics of a neutron star. This is a particular artistic rendition of a neutron star I like. Compare Earth and a white dwarf. White dwarf's about the same size. But think of taking that white dwarf and collapsing it to something a few miles across. You may not even see the little pixel illuminated there, representing the approximate scale for a neutron star. So a summary sentence I might put together for what a neutron star is, is that it is an object that's hot and dim and massive and small and crackling with magnetism and spinning like a motor. Sounds a little bit contradictory almost, but in fact it's not. In science, we always want evidence to corroborate our theories. And oftentimes the evidence throws out a theory. You always got to go with the evidence. It trumps. Theory. It's wonderful when they come together. Well, the discovery of neutron stars, evidence for neutron stars, is a case in point. In 1967, young graduate student Jocelyn Bell, using a radio telescope, was picking up regular clock-like signals with atomic clock precision. Now, the team associated with this didn't know what to make of it. Were these alien signals? Had they discovered alien life? Until they could sort this out, they termed the project LGM for Little Green Men. It's kind of cute. She had stumbled across an amazingly important discovery, namely the pulsars. 
and the pulses from Cygnus, which you had found and they were observing, were situated very precisely from one to the other. Notice this graph. The pulses don't look so clean. There's noise in the background more than is even shown here. And the peaks, the heights of the pulses are quite variable. However, the spacing between the pulses has this very precise period of 1.33730119 seconds. So that is incredibly precise and requires a physical explanation. That is certainly not happenstance. It's turned the, the object associated with this in Cygnus was termed pulsar for pulsating star. For all they knew, that's what it was, some kind of pulsating star. However, a star that's pulsating, literally, say, physically expanding and contracting, could not do it that quickly. There's no possible way it could do it. It would have to exceed light speeds and, and, and extremes of physics that, well, the physics doesn't allow. Moreover, a star or even a white dwarf being a stellar mass and about the size of Earth would fly apart if, it, if these pulses were from rotations, which it was strongly assumed was the case. Anything rotating, even a white dwarf, would fly apart because of the extreme forces of spinning that fast. So, other pulses, pulsars were soon discovered and other supernova remnants. So they became relatively you know, common and established. And the only possible physical object that could be associated with rotating and emitting energy with periods this small were the neutron stars. So they had discovered rotating neutron stars. And again, because, this, because that kind of material is the only material that could survive such fast rotation speeds, it put to rest the skepticism associated with what these objects are. So neutron stars spinning, namely pulsars, were discovered. The Crab Nebula is an early and very well studied pulsar. It shows particles being generated into the nebula in the X-ray region. Um, Chinese records indicate that this was a supernova that appeared in 1054 AD. One of the earliest pulsars and it rotates at 33 in 33 milliseconds. So for a long time, it held the record for the fastest pulsar. And again, a white dwarf would fly apart at these kind of rotation speeds. So neutron star was the answer. Here is a detailed look at the object in the center that has some very interesting features that are very rare to actually image. So here's the Crab Nebula in a little more detail, and we are fortunate to have the opportunity to image some of the theoretical phenomena associated with these extreme objects like pulsar winds and pulsar jets, these outflows from highly twisted magnetic fields, synchrotron radiation spraying out particles and producing the phenomena that the models suggest they ought to. Here's actual data from the pulsar. We have the primary and the secondary pulses seen spaced at 0 0.033 seconds. So this particular object, as detailed as it's been studied, has given very good evidence for the pulsars actually being rotating neutron stars. Pulsar theory is now quite well established. We have this spinning neutron star and a magnetic field associated with it. And just like Earth, the dipole structure of the magnetic field is not in alignment with the rotation axis. And so that turns out to be the key to produce the pulses that we see. So we have beams of radiation coming from the magnetic poles as these magnetic fields are twisted. And they have to be out of alignment with the rotation axis or it's never going to be aimed at Earth. So here's how that works. So we have the beam going in this direction, again, coming off the magnetic pole. 
And if that's in the same direction as Earth, we're going to see that beam. Not when it's over here. So the Earth direction is still the same, but when this thing spins around, it's going to be not lined up with Earth most of the time, but just that one time when it sweeps through. It's the lighthouse model. Have you ever gone by an airport and seen the lighthouse beacon as it spins around? Once per spin, you see the flash. Same idea. So, again, the gases are accelerated and from the twisted magnetic fields and causes the axial beams to release a lot of energy. And the pulsar also gradually slows down, so that's studied as well. But all pulsars are neutron stars. Not all neutron stars, however, are pulsars. So turns out that some neutron stars don't have the ability to produce pulses like we see here. But if they are, if they are pulsing, it's still from a neutron star. So a neutron star is the fundamental constituent of this phenomena. Neutron stars all have very high magnetic fields associated with them. But every now and then, we find a neutron star that is way beyond the norm for even a neutron star, with magnetic fields so massive that they can literally crack through the surface. Now, pulsars that we observe associated with high magnetic fields have fields that are a trillion times the magnetic field strength of Earth already. Yes, a million, million times. But a small fraction of these pulsars have magnetic fields that are a quadrillion times or a thousand times the, the field strength normally associated with a pulsar. So this is termed a magnetar appropriately. Not extremely well understood, but nevertheless, this condition could probably occur if the neutron star is extremely hot on the order of 100 billion Kelvin and rotating very rapidly, at least 100 revolutions per second. Well, this, these kind of temperatures and spins cause convection, the motion of the material inside, which is not a crystal, greatly amplifying the magnetic field so that the surface can crack and buckle as the magnetic fields blast through, causing X-ray and gamma ray photons, recognizing those are very powerful photons and may be associated with a phenomenon known as gamma ray bursts that we will encounter shortly as well. We believe a neutron star has a fairly interesting structure. The size is about six mile in radius, and their density varies from about a billion kilograms per cubic meter to 1.3 quintillion kilograms per cubic meter. All right, 1.3 times 10 to the 18. Well, that's just a number. That exponent with a 10 is beyond our comprehension, as so many things are in astronomy. But the core is very unique in that it's both it's, it's superconducting and it's a superfluid. So superconducting protons so that heat and electricity flow without restriction. Superfluid means that the motion of the fluid itself flows without restriction. So very exotic material. Surrounding the core is a superfluid. So superfluidic neutrons. And then around that is a crust, which is made of solid, brittle material, very dense nuclei. There's an interesting phenomenon that occurs that we can see when we observe the rotation period over a period of time. It's called a glitch. So we see the graph here of period versus time. And every now and then there's this glitch phenomena here. The period of the neutron star is going up because energy is being radiated, radiated away. So notice that the scale here, it's very, very tiny changes in the period. But every now and then, as it slows down, the shape of the neutron star changes. And the shape is changing because the forces involved are altering. So as it slows down, it becomes a little more spherical. So we have these extremely violent neutron star quakes, kind of like very similar to an earthquake. So as it spins down, there is a violent cracking of the surface that can occur. That's what a glitch is. 
and that readjusts the mass distribution on the neutron star. Conserving angular momentum causes it to suddenly decrease in rotation period. So it spins up a little bit and then continues its progressive slowdown that is consistent with the loss of energy from the magnetic field phenomena that we've discussed. So that is how a neutron star is put together and one of the interesting features that we see about its rotation rate. Just as white dwarfs can be in binary companionship with a large giant star that's filling its roach lobes and spilling its gas over onto it, well, so can a neutron star or any other large core. Pulsar Hercules X1 has been studied quite extensively. It's a neutron star orbiting a two solar mass red giant star. The orbit period is 1.7 days and the neutron star itself, which is a pulsar, is emitting X-ray pulses 1.24 seconds apart from each other. As material accretes onto the neutron star, it spins up. You can imagine somebody spitting a basketball and slapping the outer edge of that basketball causes it to spin up. And the material is accreting and through frictional interaction spiraling in. So the neutron star is spinning up faster and faster and it can get all the way up to about a thousand times a second to become a millisecond pulsar. It's amazing to think of that much mass spinning in one one thousandth of a second. The material that comes into a neutron star because it's gravitationally so intense is such that if you threw a brick onto the surface it would release as much energy as an atomic bomb so that just gives you an idea of how much energy can be released from material accreting onto a neutron star. And as a result of this, we have hot spots of infalling gas. So if you have a small region on the neutron star where gas is striking it, it literally hits at about 50% the speed of light. And that can produce emissions of x-rays on the order of 10,000 times the luminosity of our sun. And this is just from regions that are perhaps smaller than a, a square mile. So that's pretty incredible. And then we have X-ray bursts. X-ray bursts in the same vein as hydrogen gas accumulating on a white dwarf, where the layers build up and all of a sudden the hydrogen gas fuses and we have a nova. Well, in the case of neutron stars, the hydrogen that's hitting the neutron star is compressed so much, so rapidly, that it fuses on contact. It hits the necessary, it reaches the necessary temperatures instantly and thus fuses and builds up a helium ring, a helium shell forms. That helium shell heats and after it becomes about one meter thick, it reaches because of the incredible compression of the neutron star, the 100 million Kelvin temperature required to fuse helium. So you get a blaze of light of x-rays in particular, bursting forth from this x-ray binary. And very extreme conditions associated with these pulsar binary systems. Let's summarize this, the evolutionary process that stars of all mass ranges undergo. So this is a graph of mass going in this direction and time going in this direction, not necessarily to scale. Every star starts out as a protostar. So you'll see that common to all the mass ranges. At the very lowest end, and it's not even producing a star, are the brown dwarfs. So they are less than 0.08, 8% the mass of our star, the sun. And though they have a little bit of fusion of deuterium and lithium, they never really become a main sequence star fusing hydrogen. And they are therefore not actual stars. The first stars that are produced are the red dwarfs. Between 0.08 and 0.4 solar masses, 
They actually enter the main sequence, fusing hydrogen, but very slowly. They can last for hundreds of billions and even trillions of years, cycling all their hydrogen through, fusing it into helium. And then they just, when they're done with that, they dim and move down into the right on the HR diagram. The sequence, the mass range of 0.4 to 0.8 solar masses, including our star, the sun, lives its life on the main sequence, billions of years typically, produces a giant, goes through various stages that we discussed, becomes a low temperature red supergiant in the final phases of its life, puffs out the outer layers of its atmosphere as a planetary nebula, and becomes a white dwarf, a degenerate carbon oxygen core to dim and cool. And we haven't seen one fully dim and cool yet because the universe hasn't been around long enough. The large mass stars, 8 to 25 solar masses, they burn their fuel a lot more quickly, become a giant, a supergiant, which is more luminous than the low temperature red supergiants. And their final destiny is to blow up as a type 2 supernova, which then leaves in its wake a massive stellar core known as a neutron star that we just discussed. And finally, the most massive stars, more than 25 solar masses, they live fast and die young. They are only on the main sequence for millions of years, and they tend to be bright, hot, blue main sequence stars and form bright, hot, blue supergiants which also go into sometimes red supergiant phase, but they can become a supernova as a blue supergiant, making a massive supernova. And the final destiny of these very largest stars is to become an object that we are about ready to discuss. It's called the black hole. Perhaps the most extreme stellar remnant of all that's its destiny, and it is that to which we now turn in the final phase of this unit.